All right, so we'll just get started. I just want to do the introduction to everybody. So as I've said uh, the last two or three times, my, my name is Amir Vera. I'm the president of the Atlanta Association of Black, of Association of Black Journalists. Uh, we all want to thank you for being here with us today. We're doing this investigative journalism series called the Watchdog Academy in conjunction with the Ida B. Wells Society for Investigative Journalism. So that way we can just uh, reach out to journalists beyond you know, our two organizations' jurisdictions so that people can learn about investigative journalism. I'm now going to hand off to, oh goodness, a dog, but I'm gonna now hand off to uh, Rima Bland with the Ida B. Wells Society. Thank you. Um, and it's great to see some familiar faces from uh, those of you who join us at Ida B. Wells and, and I recognize some of the names. Um, so as Amir said, I'm Rima Bland, the director of the Ida B. Wells Society. Um, for investigative reporting and welcome all to the first installment of our Watchdog Academy. You are the inaugural class, so give yourselves a hand. Um, this is the first time that we're doing this. Um, and we are joined by, we have a, a wonderful, legendary, investigative OG maestro um, before us to talk about um, investigation. So um, just a little bit about um, our speaker today, Ron Nixon, as you might know, he is the co-founder of the Ida B. Wells Society uh, for Investigative Reporting. Um, he is also the Global Investigations Editor for the Associated Press. Um, prior to that, uh, you might know him from his work at the New York Times um, as a homeland security correspondent where he reported in Mexico, Guatemala, South Africa, Uganda, and uh, that's just to name a few. Um, and he's also the author of Selling Apartheid, um, South Africa's Global Propaganda War. Um, so I don't want to take too much more time. I could give a lot more about Ron, but um, I'm going to hand it over to um, Ron to get started. So once again, welcome to the program. And we look forward to answering your questions throughout near the end. Um, and also just one more PSA. If you have not muted yourself, please do so at this point. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you for that introduction, Rayma. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, let me say thank you to the Atlanta Association of Black Journalists for co-hosting this for with the Ida B. Wells Society. Uh, it's always great to team up with, with NABJ uh, members. Um, and we actually did, I think, well, not I think, but we actually did one of these where the idea came from is when I did this uh, a few years back for Chicago NABJ. So happy to be back to joining with uh, one of the, the regionals to, to do this. Um, so again, I just wanna say thank you guys for, for hosting this uh, with the IDB Wild Society. And, uh, and then Raymond, thank you for that great introduction. Didn't consider myself an investigative reporting OG, but okay, I'll take it. Um, <clears throat> And, and so the title of this, you know, it's a, the title implies, so you want to be an investigative reporter. And normally we do these sessions about like doing, getting records and things like this. But what I want to talk about is like, how do you even get to that point? Right? Like what makes a good investigative reporter? And what are the things that you, you need in order to, to be one? And keep in mind when we say, an investigative reporter, we don't mean that everybody's going to have the title. It's possible to do investigative work without actually having the title. Obviously, titles matter, and we want that title because one of the one of the well, the reason that the Ida B. Wells Society was formed because there's so few people of color in the field of investigative reporting. So, but that being said, again, you don't necessarily have to have the title to do investigative work. So, so I'm going to talk. Um, so I'm going to talk you through a couple of things, and then I will try to take questions throughout, but would prefer to have them wait to the end. So we'll we'll save enough time to to be able to do that to the end. And Rayma, Amir, you guys keep me set with, in terms of the time. So am I? Can I? Can I go ahead and do um, the? Um, can I share my screen? Yeah, but one second, Ron. I just took my screen. 
signing off. But I also wanted to introduce uh, ABJ's vice president of print, uh, Raisa Habersham. So Raisa, if you could just say a couple words before uh, Ron begins. Hi, everyone. I'll be uh, very brief because I know we want to listen to what advice Ron has. Um, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, as Amir and Rayma said, this is a three-part series. Um, so if you enjoyed this one, I encourage you to join us for um, our April um, session and our May session. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us, and I appreciate it, and I look forward to hearing what Ron has to say. Okay. Well, thank you. And also, congrats on the not so new job, but relatively new job. Um, congrats. Um, so I still can, uh, um, whoever the host is, can you guys let me share the screen? Okay, there we are. All righty. Yeah, quick second here. Okay, so, um, you know, again, name is Ron Nixon, I'm a global investigations editor for AP and co-founder of the IWA Society for Investigative Reporting. So let's just go ahead and jump into this. Oops, okay. All right, so what do you see here? Why don't everybody just take a minute to, to look at this, right? All right, so this is like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Like everybody has heard this story, right? Or like read it to your kids if you've got kids, right? Yes, give me a show of hands. Yes, thumbs up or what have you. Um, but this is what I see. I see a crime scene. Goldilocks is breaking and entering. She ate their food in their house, destruction of property. And then when you look at the image there, it's inaccurate framing because the bears look menacing around her, even though she broke into their house, right? So why do I bring this up? When you're in, to be an investigative reporter, you need certain characteristics that some can be taught, some can't. And I always showed my students this and we talked about the Goldilocks and the Three Bears, but basically she was, she broke into their house, right? But it, the bears are made to seem like they're the ones doing something bad. But that's what we call like framing, right? Like the frame there is you got the three bears circling the bed, she's there sleeping in the bed with the teddy bear. But unless you read the story, you know, if you're not familiar with the story, she broke into their house. So as an investigative reporter, you need to be able to think critically. And what that means is you need to see stuff to look at the same thing that everybody else sees, but think about it in a different manner. And so you also need to be able to think creatively. And that means that when you've got so everybody has done all of this stuff on one topic and you're trying to think about how do I get into this topic? You need to be able to think about it in a way that helps you differentiate for all the stuff that's been done before so you can do something new. And we'll talk more about that, that later. You need to be able to organize vast amounts of information. Um, this is key because as an investigative reporter, you're rarely ever going to be able to build something off of like one document or one interview. And just in journalism and in, in general, you should never base anything off of one document or one interview. You need to develop a document state of mind. What do I mean about a document state of mind? A document state of mind is thinking that somewhere out there is the document that you need. You constantly have to be thinking about where is the document that I need and who has that document? Which then leads us into understanding freedom of information laws, both federal and state laws. This is critical because so many of us, when we use freedom of information laws, it's always reactive. What I've tried to instill in my team at the AP is to be 
offensive with the Freedom of Information Act. That is, we're going after stuff all the time. We're not just waiting for something to happen and then file FOIAs for it. We're going after stuff all the time. We're going after stuff thinking about, okay, what might we need? And then how is this going to be evergreen down the road? Because you're rarely ever going to get the information that you need like tomorrow or the day after that. Next, regularly cultivating sources. This is something that you know, I've learned years ago that reporters are terrible at, uh, and so was I. Uh, and that is, we don't regularly cultivate sources, right? You know, we have a few people that we talk to and then we call them up when we need something, but source cultivation is ongoing. It's all day, you know, not all day, but it's every day. Like you should always be cultivating new sources. And sourcing, is like insurance, right? Like you don't get into an accident and then you try to get insurance. So you don't go get into that car accident and then go, oh my God, I need insurance. You have the insurance before you need it. Sourcing is the same way. You always need to have the sources because when you need them, they're there. But the other thing is you don't treat your sources like, you know, we all got that cousin Pookie or Ray Ray that calls you up every 15 years want something, right? Like, hey, yo, what up? Can, can you, can you help, let a brother hold something? I mean, don't be that person. Talk to your sources regularly. It's called cultivation for a reason. You constantly have to talk to people. You talk to people even when there's nothing, there's not a story that's there, but you constantly talk to people, right? And lastly, this is something that as a, if you get into this business and you get into investigative reporting to be liked, you are in the wrong business. You have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Like you've, you've got to understand that people are not gonna like you and you gotta be okay with that. That's, that's, that's just the nature of the business, right? Rightfully or wrongfully, people just are not going to like you. And if you want to be liked, this is not the area for you. Okay, so the basis of any good investigation is the idea. You don't have any ideas unless, I mean, you don't have an investigation unless you have a really good idea. And I'm going to go through these and then I'm going to give you an example here of some things that, that I have done and where this where the idea came from. So the first thing is reading, right? And I know we say we all read stuff, but what I mean reading, I mean reading with an eye for ideas. So when you read reports, you read newspapers, you read studies, and play close attention to footnotes when you're reading studies in particular. Play real close attention to footnotes. In 1993 um, or 1992, 93, early 90s, there was this reporter for the small newspaper, Eileen Wilson in New Mexico at, at the Albuquerque Tribune. She won a Pulitzer Prize for showing that the US had experimented on veterans with plutonium. And this went all the way back to like the 40s. She got the idea while working on another story and reading a footnote from an animal study that mentioned a person that was injected with plutonium. That led her to doing all the reporting and she ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize. It changed laws, Bill Clinton apologized uh, on behalf of the US government, but it all started with the footnote. Reading reports, reading other newspapers. I'm gonna share a, a story here that I did that came from reading another, um, reading another news organization's newspaper. So 
I did this story about a surveillance program at the Postal Service. I mean, we all think about the Postal Service. You put a stamp on something and you send it, right? But they also have a law enforcement section called the Postal Inspection Service. Well, they run this thing called mail covers where they look at everything on the outside, front and back of your mail so they can track who you're communicating with. And law enforcement agencies can, can ask for this. Um, and they will do this. So I, I got this story by reading a story in the Buffalo News. In the Buffalo News, it mentioned this guy, Leslie James Pinkerin, had been part of an environmental group. And he, had, um, he was under surveillance. And they just, they just kind of casually mentioned in the story that the Postal Service had copied his, you know, there was a note saying copy all of his mail before putting it out. And that was the end of it. And, you know, maybe for that reporter, that was okay because he was doing a local story. But I was fascinated by like, what the heck is the Postal Service doing with the surveillance program? And so I ended up doing this research and it turns out it's this massive program that had like very little oversight. And I ended up doing two pieces, this one and another one. And it led to the first audit of the program since the seventies. The head of the Postal Inspection Service testified before Congress for the first time since like the seventies. Uh, they put sort of, cur they curtail the program uh, so that anybody just can't ask for the stuff. And if you abuse the program before, they won't, uh, they won't do this for you. But again, it all started with me reading another news organization's article. Because I'm looking for, when I'm reading, I'm looking for ideas. I'm not just reading other people's stuff. I'm looking for ideas. And maybe there's something in an article that that reporter didn't get to. Personal observations. We underestimate how much we actually see every day that could lead to investigative stories. And I've done a number of stories just based off of things that I've just seen on my day-to-day -day commute to work. Well, back in the old days, we actually commuted to work. Um, but, you know, when you're walking around and you're in a neighborhood and you see potholes, right? Let's just look at a pothole. Why are there potholes? Who's responsible for the potholes? How much money is there for potholes? How do potholes get there? You know, it's basic stuff like that. You know, if you're a parent or if you cover education, a textbook is the basis of the, the instructions for kids in school. Okay, how much do we pay for textbooks? Who wrote the textbook? What's in the textbook? Who are the vendors for the textbook? You know, the Washington Post had a story a few years back about this young lady, this, this little girl who um, took her new textbook home to her mom. And in the textbook, it was in Virginia, the textbook said that about 20,000 African-Americans had fought for the Confederacy, which is an interesting figure in of itself. But the mom just happened to be a history professor at University of Virginia. It was like, that's complete BS. So it turned out that the company that did, did the textbook had hired this lady who was not a historian. She saw a figure on the Sun, the Confederate Veterans website and just put it into a textbook that ended up with kids reading this, right? So don't underestimate the stuff that you see day to day when you're looking for investigation, because I always hear people say, well, I need to find something to investigate. No, you need to observe the stuff around you. You need to read and look for ideas as you're doing both. Uh, the next thing is a tip from, from sources. And I know, you know, we think that, um, you know, we're talking to people and, and they'll give us tips and things. But the, the key thing is to make it easy for people to send stuff to you. Get on Signal, get on Telegram, um, and make it easy, get like Proton Mail, uh, which is a secure email. 
and make it easy for people to give you stuff because especially if you're getting folks who work for the government or work in sensitive areas, they're putting their careers on the line to get stuff to you. So make it easy for them to get stuff to you. And also um, they can do it with a degree of anonymity, but you wanna make sources know that you're the person that they can come to for things. And one of the ways to do that is to do good reporting so people see it and identify you as the person that they wanna go to when they do have something um, to, to send. And the last thing here in terms of getting the idea is a two notebook rule. This is something that I learned as a, as a young reporter. The two notebook rule is this, you're going to cover a fire. You're going to cover some policing something, right? But while you're there, look around for other stuff that may be of interest. And what and so while you're while you're doing your daily stuff, you write it in your notebook, the stuff that you're there for. But then the other stuff, you carry your second notebook, and this is the one where you put your ideas in. So I'm there. I noticed that, you know, there's one fire truck there. There's this massive fire and there's one fire truck there. So I cover the fire, but then I write down one fire truck. Like, why is there one fire truck there? You know. Or, you know, while I'm there, I notice that all of the firemen are white. Like, why is that? Where are the diversity efforts of, of all the fire department, the fire department there? So with my one notebook, I write down the daily, what I'm there to do. And then my second notebook, that's my idea notebook. That's what we call the two notebook rule. Please start, start doing that because it will help you generate ideas while you're out doing the things that you're, you're there for. Okay, so once you've got the idea down, you wanna test this idea. First thing is, can you get sources to talk to you? Like I have a thousand ideas, right? Of stuff that I can do, but can I get somebody to talk to me about it? I have a story that has bugged me for 20, over 20 years, right? I know it's there. I just can't get anybody to talk about it. I know it, but I have no sources to talk about it. So that's the first thing you want to test. Like, do we have the sources to be able to tell you or get you more about the topic that you're interested in? The second thing is, can we get documents? Because, you know, documents are like gold in investigative reporting, right? It's sources are gold, but documents are like two bars of gold because the documents allow you to point to an official piece of paper or something from a particular government agency or a corporation that you can say, okay, that came from internal, right? We didn't say that, that came from them. So that's your documents. The key about documents that I've never had a document say to my editor that it was misquoted, you know? So while it's great to have sources and you definitely need sources, it's equally great to get those documents. But can you get the documents to back up the story that you're trying to do? And then can we get the data? Can I prove that more people died from this thing than that thing? Can I show that more black people or Latino people are stopped by police than the population. Can I prove that? Can I, can I get the data that actually shows that? Because, you know, into my next point is something that you can prove. It's not what I know, it's what I can prove. Lawyers will tell you this all the time. I know a lot of stuff, but can I prove what I know? And that's the key here in testing your idea. And if you can't meet these, you need to go back to the drawing board and start off. Okay, 
this is where you get your editor involved because once you've got your idea down, right? You've got it solid. Now you need to make, you need to convince somebody like me that you need to time and the resources to go do this. And that can be hard, especially if it's me. <clears throat> I'll just say that up front. So this is where you make your pitch. And you gotta think about your pitch like it's an elevator pitch. From the time that you get into that elevator to the time that door closed, you Did he freeze? Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, hmm. God love Zoom. Um, yeah, he's, I think he's probably then just not moving at all. We might have gotten kicked off. Apologies, everyone. Let's see what's going on. <laughs> yes, uh, he left it. That was for effect. Uh, the car, <laughs> Zakiri. Did I say your name right, Zakiri? Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> it was for the. It was for the effect. Um, he's well, coming back right now. Okay, he's coming back in. All right, great. Um, well, I guess in the meantime, we did have a question about those websites. Hey, oh. sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm back. Um, did I did I like cut out or something? Was was it me? Yes. Okay. Apologies for that, folks. So, um, I think I was here at the yes, common were. problem with pitches. Okay. So, am I okay now? I'm not freezing. I'm no, good. You're not freezing. Okay. okay. So. Some of the common problem with pitches are that they're overly broad. You go in and say, I want to look at, you know, why this city sits on a swamp. Like, okay, that's, that's broad. Like, what about it? Right. So you need to be more specific. The second problem with pitches is that they're overdone. It's like, look, I know that it's important to cover certain things, but just because you you saw that the that the Tampa Bay Times did it, does that mean we need to do it? You know, we need to do stuff that's unique to us, not because somebody else does. And then you have the noun project, right? Which is, I want to look into drugs. Okay, what about them? You know, I want to look into crime. What about it? Um, it's too small in scope or the potential impact. Because for me, if you're doing something, it's got to have impact. And, you know, I see too many things that passes for investigative reporting. And I'm like, you really need somebody to spend two weeks on that? I, I mean, they could have just sat at their desk and done that, right? Uh, it's too difficult to quantify, right? Like, okay, are there really UFOs? and Roswell, New Mexico. I mean, how do you quantify that? Like, what do you, what do you measure that against? Like, are there, is there a database or something of UFOs? Like, it, it, that's something that is just too, too big to quantify or the data doesn't exist or it's flawed. But here's the thing about the lack of data sometimes can be the story too. And this goes back to that, that creativity. Uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, one of the other co-founders of IUB Wells, was talking about a story that she did um, where they were saying when she was in Portland, and they said that Portland was like a city that was, um, I forgot what number for human trafficking. And so she asked like, why? And they said, well, it was a major metropolitan near like interstates. Okay, but most metro, major metropolitan areas are, are near interstates. I mean, that's how they get to be major metropolitan areas. So what's unique about that? But ultimately what she found was that the, re, 
what people were doing was referring to a report from the FBI, but the FBI report, when you read the footnote, actually referred to another report that says these many people were at risk of human trafficking. Not actually trafficking, but at risk of human trafficking. So that became the story. So sometimes the lack of data can actually be the story. A flawed data can be the story. Another problem with, with pitches is that they're too complicated. If you can't summarize it to me in one or two sentences, you don't know, you don't know the story. You haven't done enough to figure out what the story is. Uh, sometimes what you're pitching simply won't fly in the newsroom. And what I mean by won't fly in the newsroom, like if you pitch a story to me at AP about um, human trafficking in West Africa, okay, I'm going to say, go ahead, go do it. But if you're in Savannah and you pitch your editor about a story about human trafficking in West Africa, what's going to happen? Like, unless it's tied to Savannah, you're probably going to get turned down, right? So you have to think about that. Like when I'm pitching stuff, obviously you want it to be something that's in your area. A lot of what I see when people pitch stuff to me is you don't have enough homework to back up the premise of what you're saying. And when, when I start questioning you, if you can't answer, then it, again, it doesn't mean you, you don't know the story. And also common pitch problem is asking a question that you won't be able to answer, which we, we've talked about here before. Oops. Okay. So yeah, make sure I get the right. Okay. Yeah. So these are things to considering when you are making your pitch. How long is this going to take? What will we have to expend the resources? Like, is this going to cost us a bunch of money? Because those are things that your editor's got to think about. You got to think about that too. Uh, is this the best time to do this investigation? Like, it's the best time to write about issues with the school probably is during the school year, right? Not when people are out on spring break. You know, can you test this thesis before you jump all in with it, right? Can you um, say, all right, this happened in this one city. So let me check to see if this happened in the neighbor's, neighboring city too. If it does, you may be on to something. If it doesn't, Maybe it's just something that you can do in your city and you just craft it as a story just for your city and not try to blow it up and make it any bigger. Um, the, the one thing I've, I've learned to do as I've gotten older and served uh, as an investigative reporter and editor is I've become a real fan of rolling investigations. And what do I mean about rolling investigations? A lot of investigative reporting that you see is they hit you with like a three-part series, right? Boom, boom, boom. Sometimes it's even more than that. But I've become a fan of like these incremental investigations, right? Like you do one, drop an investigation, let some time pass, then you drop another piece of it, right? And I think the best example of that is Watergate, right? For me, it's Watergate. Um, for my era, because Watergate was not an investigative series that was done by Woodward and Bernstein. They did piece after piece after piece, but it was a rolling investigation. It wasn't one big investigation, and then they just dropped it. They continued to do pieces. The break-in for Watergate happened in 72. Nixon resigned in 74. So that's almost two years that they did stuff and it wasn't just one series. And a rule of thumb that you need to consider when you're pitching something to an editor, the longer the time I give you, the bigger the payoff better be. So if I give you like two weeks, I'm expecting a good story. If I give you a month, you also need to be writing your Pulitzer speech because I'm going to be expecting a lot if I give you a month. So 
you know, for some people, getting that two weeks is a lot, right? So if if an editor gives you a two week, I know if I worked at the when I worked at the Roanoke Times, the editor gave me two weeks, I better come back with something good, right? If he gave me a couple of days, they were expecting a good story, but the longer the time, the better it it, it should be. And the last thing here on this slide is uber important. You have to think while you're doing these pitches, what is the minimum story that I can get if I can't get this, this big story that I want, right? So the big story is the president resigning and all of that stuff, right? But the minimum story may be that, okay, the president spent money illegally, like got money illegally, right? So you always need to think about what is the minimum story that I'm going to be able to deliver? Because you can't, I, if I give you time and I give you, let's say two weeks to come back and you come back to me in two weeks and you don't have anything, that's a problem. So you need to build in what your minimum story is going to be while you're thinking big, but this is a story that I can get if I can't get this big, big thing. How are we doing on time? Okay. We're, we're good, okay. you got about 15 minutes. Okay, so in the pitch process, you need to tell me in six words or less, what's your story? What's the question you're trying to answer? How will this story resonate with the audience? How will this story hold somebody accountable? Because that is the main thing that you're doing investigative reporting. If you do an investigation that turns up nothing, that says on the one hand this, or on the other hand that, you've wasted your time, you've wasted the editor's time, you've wasted the reader's time. The story needs to say something. Somebody needs to be held accountable. Does this story have the potential to, to, to drive change? How do we tell this story? Is it a straight hard news coming at you with a hard lead, bam? Do we come at it with an anecdotal lead? Do we try something different? You know, what media do we, do we use? Like, can we also tell this uh, with like, with a digital presentation that supplements the story or even drives the story? And then, what I want to know as an editor is like, who else has done something on this, right? Is what we're doing original here? Because I don't want to, after I give you the time to do the story, I want to come back and find out that, you know, the Dayton Daily News did the story like a month ago. And how is your, even if that's the case though, you may be able to convince me that the angle that you're doing is different from what somebody else is doing but you've got to convince me that that is the case. Okay, and then later, I'm gonna ask you to, to build your story into more detail, like one page. Give me the bullet points of your findings. What did you find? I found this, that the, that the mayor uh, had three mistresses and he had a fake business set up and you know he got illegal campaign contributions and all of these things, I need those bullet points. These are the findings. Who are the potential main characters in the story? What are the scenes? Because a good investigative story should read well. If you're gonna throw 3000 words at somebody, right, or more, it better read well. And then, what documents, data, audio have you gathered? Like, you know, what can I hear? Can I hear your interview? Can I see the the audio of of what you what you've done, right? Um, I mean, can I see the the visuals of what you've done? Can I see the data? Can you pull up the spreadsheet and show me what you've done here? And then, I re I'm repeating this because it's important. Who else has covered this? Again, I don't want to see you pitch something to me 
And then I find out later that CNN just did this. Okay. Um, the reporting process. Organize, 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 organize your documents and interviews because this is going to pay off later. Right? Because there have been times where I've written a draft of a story and I got this killer quote in there. And this is a banging quote, right? But I can't remember where the quote came from. And I can't remember when I interviewed the person. And I can't find it in my notes. And I'm sitting there in a pool of tears because I got to cut it because I don't remember where it came from. So organize your notes and your interviews so you don't get into that situation. And also this helps you when you're going through the fact checking process. Try to record your interviews because I do not want people to come to me and say, well, you know, that's not what I said. And don't wait until the last minute to do interviews with the subject of your investigations because you never know when you may get a chance to talk to that person again. That may be your one and only chance. And the other thing too is, I'm a firm believer in giving people time to respond to stuff. Don't call me up 15 minutes before you hit the publish button and say, hey, about these allegations that you stole 15 billion from the bank. I mean, come on, that, that is not fair, right? And you gotta be fair to people. You know, I give people at least, depending on the subject, 48 hours to answer stuff. Because I think in two days, you should be able to, to craft your lie. I mean, your answer. Uh, so <laughs> write as you go. I preach this to reporters all the time. Write as you go, because the last thing that you want is to get to the end of all of this stuff. And you're sitting there looking at a blank computer screen and a blank Word doc, and you're trying to figure out where do I start? If you write as you go, then you can write the scenes while they're still fresh in your mind. You can write what the person looked like. You know, the next, which leads me to the next thing here, gather the scenes and colors from the interviews, not just the facts. Notice things that are around you, right? I once went to go, when I was um, working for a, a weekly black newspaper in South Carolina, I was asked to go interview this guy who was running for the school board. Get to his house, we're sitting there interviewing him and I'm looking around. And so I got up and said, hey, could I use your restroom? Not because I need to, needed to use his restroom, but because I wanted to go into his restroom to see if I might be missing something. And no, not drugs. But what I did not see is that this guy was running for school board. There was not one book visible anywhere in his house. Not one. And so I asked the dude about the book, right? And, you know, I said, you know, what's your favorite book? And what was his answer? You know what his answer is. I don't even have to tell you. What was his answer? What was his favorite book? The Bible. The Bible. That, I mean, that's, that's the fallback, right? Like if, if, if you get asked a question out of nowhere, fall back on the Bible although he couldn't recite anything from the Bible, but hey, you know what? But still, there was not one book there. So I put that in my, in my story that, you know, I observed this and there was nothing there. And think about the story structure too, as you go, right? How is this gonna, can you do this as a straight narrative, right? There's some people who are really good at doing like straight narrative stories and not clogging the story up with a bunch of, you know, according to documents and, you know, 15,000 numbers, right? But maybe that's what you need to do. But you need to think about the structure as you're doing this. And remember the readers. Remember when you're sitting down to read something, what is it that keep you reading? Right? Because if if I struggle with it as an editor, then the readers are gonna struggle with it. And you gotta remember that, that we have to think about the readers when we're, we're doing this. Uh, Raymond, how are we doing on time? 
we're at about 10 minutes left. Okay, so let me do this and then we'll we'll just take some questions. All right. Um, a key thing that you always need to do when you're doing investigations is you background the people and the documents that you're using for this story. Because I want to know how does this person who you're citing, how do they know what they know? So if you tell me, okay, well, you know, this person works at the bank, so he should know about this. Well, maybe not. What does that person do at the bank? That person could be the security guard at the bank. That person could be the janitor at the bank. Simply working at an organization doesn't mean you know about that organization. So if you're gonna cite somebody, I need to know how they know what they know. Same thing about documents. Especially in this era, you need to really need to check the documents that you get. A rule of thumbs is when you get a document, get it electronically and also, you know, what you can do for documents is right click on that document and look at the metadata of the document. You can do the same thing with, with, uh, with photos too. And you can actually see when that document was created. But also pay attention to documents when you get them too. Uh, a friend of mine, Eric Iyer in West Virginia did a story about this uh, state lawmaker who was double dipping. And the guy, a couple of days later after the, after the story ran, the guy came to Eric with, some, with, a, with a letter that says, see, no, the ethics commission signed off on this. Here's a letter. So Eric is like panicking, but he did a check on the document. He asked the, um, the state, um, state house government office about when that letterhead was in use. And so the letterhead had only been in use for like two weeks. So it would have been impossible for him getting a letter to exonerate him from a year ago with letterhead that was only put into place like two weeks ago. So pay attention to the documents and data that you, that you get, right? And be aware of what the agenda is for people who are talking to you. Like, why are they talking to you? Always ask, how do you know this? If people, if somebody says, hey, I know, do you know this firsthand? Did you hear from somebody? Did you, you know, is it like, you know, Pookie said, Ray Ray and them, and his auntie's cousin's uncle's daughter, wife said, okay, that's like fifth, sixth hand, right? If you don't know this firsthand, if the person knows the second hand, how do you know that? Remember, sources are not your friend. If they are, they don't need to be your source. So with that, I'm going to stop here because I, I think we got a little time for questions. And I, I, I'm i sorry we had the little glitch there. Um, I, I think it, it's my the internet on my, my end. But I see there's a lot of stuff in the chat. So hopefully. Um, I can get to those questions. And I guess since we did, uh, sorry, Raisa, I know you're going to take on the questions, but I just would say, because we've gotten this request before that if people want to maybe stick around, Ron, are you okay with taking questions a little? Yeah, after? I'm good. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, so, so far we have, do have uh, one question in the chat right now. Um, it says, I struggle with story structure, especially if I have more than 10 sources right. and a lot of information from export sources. Right. What advice can you give or books to read? Okay, so first of all, uh, let, me, let, me, let me just throw out something here. All right, so when you've got, let's say you're gonna bake a cake, right? Okay, we got the flour, we got the eggs, we got the sugar, we got all of this stuff, right? We got this big bag of flour, right? Okay, do we use all the flour or do we use the flour that we need? The same thing applies with like sources, right? Just because you have 10 sources doesn't mean you need to use all of the sources. 
you need to use the sources that get across the point that you're trying to make in that particular in, in particular section, right? Especially if you got a bunch of sources saying the same thing. If you got sources saying competing things, then you need to re-interview people, right? But if you've got um, okay, if if you've got like ten sources, you don't need all of them. You can summarize what they're saying in a graph and then use the person that has the best quote to illustrate what it is that you're going to say. Um, and in terms of a book, there's a book by, um, the book is called, uh, Do I Make Myself Clear? It's, it's by one of the deans of um, investigative journalism. He was actually, um, Hold on a second, I can, uh, Harold Evans. So Harold Evans was the, um, was the editor, he just died last year, but he was the editor of the Sunday Times um, in, in the UK. And he actually started a, uh, an investigative team. He was a, like one of the first people to put together an investigative team. And it was called the Insight Team. And that's where Spotlight at the Boston Globe gets his name from. So, but he wrote this book called, Do I Make Myself Clear, right? And um, there is a chapter two of the book, it's called Sentence Clinic. And it is, I mean, even for somebody who's doing done this for a while, it puts you through the paces because he gives you this gobbledygook and said, okay, turn this into a sentence. So I think that's, a, that's one of my favorite books to read in terms of, of clear, concise writing. But again, you know, when you've got a bunch of sources, you don't have to stick every single source into the story. You can summarize their findings or summarize what they're saying and then just have the, the person with the best quote because a quote is like the icing on a cake. It should enhance the cake. So you don't want too much icing on the cake. Um, so hopefully that answers your the, the question. Okay, the next question. Um, how do you know when to balance publishing faster versus holding out for a bigger story with deeper details? Mm -hmm. Well, that all depends on one, if you got competition for the story, right? Like if 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 I know the Washington Post is 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 working on something, which which we've had to do before. Like I've had to pull an all-nighter to edit a story because we knew the Washington Post was working on it. But if there is no competitive pressure, then you can hold the story to do a bigger and deeper dive if you think it's gonna really add to the public knowledge of a, of a topic. Now, again, it all depends on the situation. There's no hard and fast rules on that. Because again, like Watergate, they could have done like a three-part series on the break-in and been done with it, right? But this was an ongoing thing. And so they continued to do the reporting because Nixon was still in office. So the answer is, it depends. If you've got a competitive pressure, if you've got competitive pressures, then, um, then sure, you can go ahead and do it. But if you can take the time to make the story better, then I would suggest doing that. Another question we have is, can you talk about how to stay organized? Um, and I think their other question is, is Google Docs you know, a safe method of doing so? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm not, um, I'm not like a big fan of Google Docs for like investigative stuff because it's Google and, you know, they can like see the stuff, right? You know, and I mean, like perhaps uh, they can see the stuff. I don't know. I just don't trust Google, right? And I don't know where that information goes. If law enforcement comes to Google and says, hey, we need to see all of your stuff on this, if they might not give it to them. So, you know, we do internal uh, stuff to, uh, keep our uh, deck. So there, there are a couple of things that, that 
I mean, good old fashioned Word documents on your computer um, work just fine, right? Because I know money is tight and nobody wants to spend a bunch of money on different things. So I would just say, look, good old fashioned Word document. It's just fine to, to put your stuff down, but make sure that you organize it when you do that. So don't dump everything into one document. Have one document with your interviews, one document with your, um, with your timeline, which I, I was gonna mention timelines as, a, as an effective way of crafting, doing your structure. But if you're gonna do that and then have different folders for each bit of information, don't put it all in one folder. Um, the next question, what opportunities or habits should new investigative reporters seek? I am pivoting from communications and grassroots racial justice organizing to investigative reporting and am seeking info on how to immerse myself and skill up. Right. Okay. So the habits that I talked about before are like some of some of these things, because there's another question here too, is like what can be taught and, and versus what are innate. So let me answer both of those questions together from sure. uh, so thinking critically. It's hard for me to like, you know, I can help you think critically and give you a quick example. Uh, when I taught at Howard University, I asked my students came to me about this uh, thing called the Obama deception. It was a documentary that they saw on YouTube about how Obama was like put in place by the powers that be, right? And all the stuff about the birth certificate and him being born in Kenya is like, well, how do we know that's not true? And, I, and so I put a little test to them about critical thinking. Like I said, well, when was Obama born? Nobody knew, so we had to Google it and it was 1961, all right? So I said, well, when did Kenya become a country? Nobody knew, so we had to Google that too. So it's 1963, right? So my question to them then is, how does one get a birth certificate from a place that didn't exist when they was born, when he was born? And would he be a citizen of Kenya? Or if you know the history of Kenya, it was a colony of the UK. So he would have been a British subject, right? So, but that's the kind of critical thinking that you can push people towards it, but that's kind of innate. Like, you know, people have to really think, I can't teach you how to be creative about stuff, right? I can suggest things, but those things are really hard to like teach. I know that there are courses, college courses in critical thinking, but you got to come with something, right? And, and I think that that's, that's really hard for a lot of people because they, they get tunnel vision for a story and they won't let it go. And you're trying to get them to think another way, but they just won't let that go. And you're saying, but that's, but that's been done before. So critical thinking, creatively thinking, those are the things that are a little hard to do. Having that drive to keep going, I can't teach that. Because you're gonna, you know, investigative reporting is like this, right? Like you start out on this high because you've given an opportunity to do it. And then you hit these lows. And then you think to yourself, oh my God, I suck, right? Like I'm never gonna get this done, right? And then you hit a high because you get this document or you get this interview and you go, hey, I'm a badass, right? And then you hit another low and you go, damn, I suck, right? And, and so you've got to be able to weather those roller coasters, right? I, I can't teach you that, you know? So, you know, those are the things in, in a lot of the stuff you, you talk about communication and, and, and grassroots racial justice, a lot of the stuff that people do there, we do the same thing. We just do it for publication. You know, we're seeking an impact. You know, yes, we want to have an impact. We don't want the story to go out and nobody reads it, right? We, we want there to be an impact for, for, for the story. So the things I can teach you, I can teach you how to write. I can teach you how to file FOIAs. I can teach you how to structure a story, right? Those things I can teach you. But the other stuff, creativity, those kind of things, I also can't teach you how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. 
you have to understand that you got to understand that you're going to write something and people are going to call you up. They're going to troll you on Twitter. They're going to send nasty stuff to you on Facebook. They're going to email nasty stuff to you. They're going to call you name and you've got to be like, whatever. Peace out. And thanks for reading. That's my, that's my answer to when people send me stuff. Thank you for reading, you know, but you've got to be comfortable with that. And not everybody is not, you know, mainly human beings like to be liked. And I can't, I, that's something I can't teach you how to be uncomfortable. I mean, comfortable with being uncomfortable. Okay. Um, another question we have is what should we do if sources say they don't want to be recorded? What if we can't remember everything? Right. So I, so a couple of things, one, like, I don't want to go against anybody's wishes if they don't want to be recorded, especially, you know, me coming up in there, a guy named Nixon saying, Hey, can I record you? Right? Like that's the last thing that people want to do. So, so you know, okay. Young people, Nixon was president long, long time ago. Just, just, just FYI. But so the first thing I would do to them though, and I do this to people all the time <clears throat> when I was reported that is, I will say to them, look, I'd like to record this and I'll even give you a copy of the recording because mm -hmm. I want to be accurate with this, right? I don't want anything to be misinterpreted, misconstrued. So this is why I want to record this. And again, I'm happy to give you a copy of the recording. So we can both have the same exact thing. You can look at it and go, okay, you accurately quoted me. I can look at it and say, I accurately quoted you. That's how I get a lot of people who don't want to be recorded on, you know, on recording because I'm, I'm saying to them, because what I don't want is for the story to run. And then you come back and say, you didn't tell me something. I want us both to be based off of the same thing here. Like you, you said this, this is what I heard. Now, if it gets to the point where they go, you know, I just don't want to be recorded, right? Fine. You know, but that means that you have to take good notes and good note taking doesn't mean you write down everything. It means you write down the things that you need for the story. You write down that great quote, you write down when they're describing something and don't be afraid to go back to people. I don't know how many people saw that movie like Denzel was in years ago called Philadelphia. In that movie, he kept saying, okay, explain this to me like I'm a five-year-old. It's okay to be dumb and, and stuff or, you know, I'm from the South. So we have this thing where we call country dumb, right? Like let people think that you're dumb and let them just keep yakking, but keep them talking. So you don't need to write down everything. It's not stenography. We're writing down the most salient quotes. We're writing down the most important information. And if they say something and they cite a specific figure or a number or something like that, ask them, hey, uh, can I get a copy of that report? You know, can I get a copy of, of, of what you, where you got that information from, right? So again, that's, so that means you don't have to write every single thing down. Um, we have uh, one question. I think you can answer both of these, though. Um, the first one is, can you suggest some quick turnaround stories, given the agencies are really stalling on data, using COVID as an excuse? And I've had that experience. Um, the other one is, I have experience doing investigative stories in public agencies, but haven't done many on private companies. Are there stories or series you can recommend we check out to be inspired? And the example they gave was reveal series on Amazon workers that use OSHA. Uh, OSHA. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so the first one from Karen here is a quick turnaround story given stalling on data. So a couple of things, you know, not all data has to come from like within the agency. Some, some things are, are up. So what I tend to do in, in, in situations is look for multiple places where I can get the same information, right? Uh, now give an example. When I was in, in, in Minnesota, um, we asked, uh, after there was a mass shooting on an Indian reservation, we asked them for their data on 
um, program for young people because a young man who had killed well, was a youth. And they met and they came back and said, nope, we're a sovereign nation, so we don't have to give you anything. And we're like, okay, cool. So, but everybody reports to somebody. Local people report to state agencies, state agencies report up to federal agencies. So there's a step everywhere in there where that data is available. And this is not in all cases, right? So we were able to go to the Bureau of, of, of Indian Affairs and get the data from the federal government that the, that the reservation, uh, that the native government wouldn't give us. Um, and that's not to pick on them, you know, there was their choice. They didn't have to give us anything, but I wanted to get the data. COVID is, is real. Uh, I just had this conversation today, right? We're, we're talking to an agency and we were talking like, you know, we're gonna have to sue because they're not giving us the information. And the person we're talking to was like, look, I can't access that information. I'm working remotely like you. So I can't access that information. You know, that's real. Some people it's not real, right? The other thing I would look at is go through their FOIA logs and see if that information has been released to anybody else. The other thing is under the, the Freedom of Information Act, federal agencies, if you're talking to federal agencies, have to put on their website, the most requested documents have to be on their website. So the documents that they get the most requests for or data they get the most requests for, it's on their website. So depending on what you're trying to get, like there are some ways around those that using the techniques that I talked about. Now, sometimes, as I said, COVID is real and you just can't get it because the people don't have access to it. Um, you know, I, I don't know the story, but you know, if you talk about the agency, I may be able to, to, to help you. So if you wanna shoot me like a, an email, I may be able to help you and promise not to steal your story. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so the other ones, uh, about doing on private public agencies, but uh, not on private companies. All right. So, um, and you mentioned the Amazon workers on OSHA records. So remember the Lion King, like the original Lion King, where um, Simba is told about the circle of life, right? Like everything fits within everything else, the whole circle of life. Well, when I'm approaching private companies, this is what I do with my circle of influence, right? So let me grab a pen here. You, you mentioned Amazon and using OSHA records. So what I do is I take a piece of paper and I write, draw a big circle. And then I put my company in the middle here. And then I look for all the ways that company intersects with the public sector. Okay, somebody has probably sued them. So there are court records. You know, they've got OSHA records, right? They've got local, they've got business licenses, right? You know, they may do business with a publicly traded company. So they may be mentioned in SEC records, right? There are people who used to work at that company. I go to LinkedIn and I find people who used to work at that company in the areas that I'm trying to find. So you, you create your big circle and then you look for all the places where this company has government contracts, right? This company gave contributions, right? This company probably lobbies. So there's a bunch of records, even though it's a private company, there's a bunch of public records about that private company. You know, they, they probably dump sewage. EPA has records on them. The local Department of Environmental Control has records on them. So create your circle of influence and then think about all the people in the public sector who they would interact with. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Okay. 
Um, so we're gonna uh, start to wrap it up, but we have uh, two final questions. So I'm gonna combine um, mm -hmm. into one. Um, the first one is revisiting the conversation about recorded conversations. He says, what if they don't want it recorded because they're scared you'll leak it and ruin their anonymity? Um, and the other question is, how would you handle your main source ghosting you out of fear? Okay, so let me deal with the, the, the first one uh, is they don't want to, like, look, if you're dealing with sources, right, and they don't want to be recorded, I, I try to respect people's wishes, right? But I also warn them, too, that I don't want to hear at the end of this, once the story runs, that you didn't say this. So here's what I do. Let me go back to my pencil and paper again. So I will write down, oh, I'm out of paper. Oh, okay. So I will write down all the stuff, you know, here's a quote that I'm gonna use. Here's the, the summary and information. And I have them initially. So we agree on it. So I'm gonna have you put your initial here so that we agree on it. And we're gonna put the date and time on this notebook. So we agree that you said that. So when the story runs, you don't come back and say that, I mean, not initials, but your signature on here, because initials can be anything, but you, you sign this saying that, hey, listen, these are my quotes, right? And after the story runs, we can tear this up, but I need to show my editor that you actually said this, right? Because again, I don't want you coming back saying you didn't say this. And, you know, if they don't go for that, then, you know, depending on how bad I need the information, we may negotiate something where we can talk, but mainly I need to have the documentation to show that we talked. Because the main thing is, I don't want you coming back saying you were misquoted. So, and then what was the second one there? The second one was, how do you handle your main source ghosting you out of fear? I was, your main source doing what now? Ghosting you. So basically disappearing. Oh, oh, oh yeah. So that's happened a, a, a lot of time. We're actually dealing with that now, that the source has disappeared and it's allegedly in Australia, but we, we don't know. Um, you know, other than trying to get them to 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 come back and, and talk to you by by one thing is is that like I said before in in my presentation, always give your sources a secure way to talk to you and to reach you, right? To show that you care about their anonymity and that you're not gonna just blurt out who they are publicly, right? So the only person that needs to know, depending, you know, very sensitive sources, the only person that needs to know is the reporter and me. That's it. Because I got to know the source, right? And the reporter needs to, will know the source. But other than that, nobody else really needs to know unless there's a lawsuit and we can get into that. But you, you try to, to, to do everything you can to show the person that you respect, you know, the, the the agreement of anonymity that you have have come to, and and let them. Oh no, no, no! I'm sorry. Uh, there's a question about do I ever let them read a draft of the story? Oh no, never. Uh uh So anyway, sorry. Let me, let me let me let me back up. No, that was just jumped out at me like oh no. Um, there are some people who believe in that pre-publication stuff, but no. Um, so anyway going back to getting your sources to come back from disappearing you know it's a delicate thing in talking to people like you know we had a source disappear for a year and then reappeared but i kept working on them i mean you, i didn't give up you know i kept working on them and saying okay listen look we can do this we can do that we can do this we can we can do that right and finally, you know, the source was like, okay, but I don't give up, right? I'm not gonna just say, okay, well, they disappeared, you know, maybe I hit them up every other day to say, hey, 
you out there um, still want to uh, want to talk, or can you um, can you do um, can you do this? Or hey, what if we said this? What if we said that? Would you feel better if we said this versus that? You know, would you feel better if we just communicated on signal and not email? Would you feel better if we communicated on on telegram? Um, would you feel more comfortable sending me stuff or proton mail, uh, proton mail, and not my corporate account? So you, you try to give the person whatever means there are that you have at your disposal to make them feel comfortable. Uh, yes, there will be uh, the recording will will be available once. Uh, um, um, yeah, so, um, so there's a question about like any, um, um, any, um, questions about like, can, do I have an email? Yeah, hit me up on my personal email, nixon.ron at gmail. Ron, thank you so much for yeah. joining us. We're going to go ahead and wrap it up uh, okay. for the evening, but thank you so much for sharing your knowledge as always. It's always appreciated. I'm going to kick it to Rayma, um, who will tell us about the next um, events. Yeah, sure. And we are getting a lot of questions, as we do with Ida B. Wells, about the recordings of this being available. This is being recorded. We're going to be coordinating with um, AABJ, who's actually hosting the Zoom, um, to make that available uh, in the coming days. So um, just to kind of answer that for everybody. Um, also, um, just to keep in mind, we do have two more in this series and we do hope you'll join us April 8th. We'll be doing backgrounding like a boss. So some of the things that Ron talked about today, we're gonna to delve into deeper advanced searches, um, metadata, things like that. And then follow up, we'll have our other uh, co-founder Topher Sanders of ProPublica talking about how to cultivate sources on May 11th. So we hope you'll join us. Also, if you go through all three and we are keeping track, you get a certificate too. So we'll give you a fancy, nice certificate saying that you yeah. completed the Watchdog Academy. Uh, so let that incentivize you. And if you do have any any questions or anything, feel free to follow up with Ida B. Wells or AABJ and we'll be here for you. Yeah. See you guys next time. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank, Thank you. you this was really great. Yeah, no, it was, uh, it was good to... Um good to do this and um man it's like we we ran out of time <laughs> so <laughs> well the tech issues